Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The year 2020 is a challenging year for the whole world. The sudden COVID-19 outbreak has brought a severe impact in all aspects around the world. First of all, on behalf of Sinison University, I would like to express my appreciation to all of you present at the virtual conference during this special time. As well, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the Henry Folk Foundation for supporting the joint symposium for three consecutive years. And it is indeed a great honor to have such opportunity to co-organize the annual event with the University of British Columbia. Today's symposium has manifested a successful collaboration between University of British Columbia and Sinison University. On this occasion, please allow me to introduce Sinison University first. Sanderson University was founded by Dr. Sanderson himself in 1924 and has been uh, uh, consequently ranked as one of the top, top 10 universities in China, becoming a prominent research, academic, and cultural center, both home and abroad. The origin of medical education in Sanderson University could be dated back to 1835 when Boji Hospital the first Western medicine hospital in China was officially established. This hospital is now known as Sanderson Memorial Hospital and has been one of the 10 affiliated hospitals of Sanderson University. Now we have five university campuses located in three major cities of Guangdong, including Guangzhou, Zhuhai, and Shenzhen. And the Zhongshan School of Medicine, sitting in the downtown of Guangzhou, is the oldest academic institute of Western medicine in China, which was established in 1866. According to the latest ESI index, our clinical medicine specialty ranks number two in mainland China. With nowadays, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, coordinated global action, solidarity, and the multilateral collaboration have become increasingly more necessary than ever to overcome current challenges. As the world's leading academic hubs, both University of British Columbia and Sinsen University should be obligated to extend great efforts in the global fight against this crisis. Since last year's case symposium, we have witnessed the fields used by this project. Factories on both sides have worked closely with each other in the fields of mutual interest and explored student training in the coming future. And I am certain that we will further develop our collaboration on COVID-19 research after this year's symposium by exchanging different points of view and inspiring new contexts. Last but not least, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the uh, to the honorable speakers. All of you have been working with us since the beginning of the planning phase. We sincerely appreciate your dedication as always. Most important, this program will not happen without the full support of the Hungry Folk Foundation. I hope that everyone who joins us today can all share your vision and wisdom to solve the puzzles of interesting research issues. I wish all of you a virtual meeting and good health. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Kang. I'm um, Dr. Rob McMaster. I'm Vice Dean of Research for the Faculty of Medicine. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to today's symposium, or really a mini, a mini symposium. I'm pleased that you have made the time to listen to some of the updates from both SYSU and UBC on COVID research. As was just mentioned, this is part of a series of SYSU UVC symposiums. The first being on neuroscience, where we were greatly pleased to be in Guangzhou in 2018. Uh, it certainly seems more than two years ago now after the last year. That was followed by a symposium held at UVC in 2019 on cancer. And I think as most of you know, we were planning on having a full symposium on diabetes and infectious disease in Guangzhou at SISU exactly at this time um, in Guangzhou. And clearly with the pandemic, it became 
very difficult to organize and clearly without without travel or not um, it's best to stay home. So with Professor Dunn, we did plan this mini symposium on COVID, which is clearly I mean, one of the most, you know, I would say is the most important infectious disease in 2020. And we will have um, this symposium kind of starting in a few minutes. I'd also like to really acknowledge the Falk Foundation and the UBC alumni in the Falk family for generously supporting this series of symposiums. And it really allows us to bring together colleagues, trainees, students, and postdoctoral fellows, residents from SYSU and UBC to discuss research, to listen to research, and most importantly, to enable collaborations between our two universities. And part of the funding does enable travel for both uh, professors and faculty and trainees and postdocs to participate in collaborative research. And from our previous two symposiums, we do have a number of collaborative research projects just getting going underway. So today, we will have six speakers, three from each site. Each will have 15 minutes to present, and then, depending on time, a few minutes for questions at the end of each talk. And at the end of all six, we will have a, a forum on further questions really addressed to all six speakers of, of questions that come from the audience. Uh, we will be recording the event, so it can be watched offline, and it will be made available in a few days at, at both sites, so either to review what you hear today or else have other colleagues watch it um, at, uh, if they couldn't make it to the day. So for the questions, it's probably the easiest to, is to use the question and answer, the Q&A panel on the bottom of the Zoom panel, as this will um, enable the questions to be collated in writing, and we can ask them as the, as the symposium concludes. I guess there's also a voting on other questions, so maybe we'll have a top question to see in order. Uh, we've also allowed the chat function, too, so you can, you can communicate using the chat. Um, and we may not see your questions on the chat if it um, appears, if there's too many that come, come during the next hour and a half. And we're using a web, webinar format, so attendees will not be able to, to mute or unmute themselves. And we turn the cameras off to enable the, uh, to enable the speakers to be seen. And we've always had problems on some of the bandwidth if everybody has their video on. So it's really unfortunate that we're not there in person. We're really looking forward to the the Infection and um, Diabetes Symposium, and we're now planning for that a year from now, uh, hopefully to, um, more or less at the same time of the year. So now we'll start the symposium. I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker is Dr. Josef Penninger, who is the director of the Life Science Institute here at UBC and a Canada 150 Chair of Functional Gen Genetics. You will have heard of his pioneer work with the ACE2 receptor and development of therapy stemming from the SARS epidemic in the early 2000s. And we look forward today to hearing the updates on this approach to SARS-CoV-2. Joseph, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Can you hear me? Does it work? Uh, very well. Oh, because I just installed a new microphone. So, very good. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be invited to your symposium. Uh, and uh, I've all who can share. Okay. Can I share this? Do you see my screen? Your, I see your screen, yes. Okay, <clears throat> good. Uh, then let me see. Okay. You see the full screen because of a half screen? No, it's not in full screen. You have your notes showing. Okay, how do I do this? Uh, I, think, uh, I think it's the projection. Oh, one second. <clears throat> Just a moment. <clears throat> of course, I have to start with a little hiccup, the usual. <laughs> okay, now it looks There good. it is. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks so much for inviting me. I have actually a lot of, of links to China, so I'm a lot in Beijing and also Qingdao and, and uh, Suzhou has started a new biotech company, so it would be great to hook up with some of you. <clears throat> so to to speed this along, so I want to tell you about the discovery of ACE2, where we come from, and how what we're actually doing with this in COVID-19. Uh, first, a disclaimer, I will show data from a company I started many years ago in Europe called Apiron Biologics, so you can put it into conflict of interest. Uh, in, and I have to thank 
of course, people who give me the money to do the research are UBC. I'm now the head of the Life Sciences Institute, and I'm a Canada 150 chair in a research chair in functional genetics. So many years ago, uh, I was interested as a young scientist in Toronto, this must have been 22 years ago, in genes which would regulate the development of fly hearts. So this is a beating drosophila heart. And we had particular markers. So this was the time before CRISPR and, and um, genome editing. So we were relying on natural mutants, so-called P-element mutants. And we were interested in fly embryos in the formation of the heart tube. So these are markers uh, which would be uh, used to form, to develop heart tubes. And when we looked at mutants, we actually realized that flies had two copies of one gene which had been known in mammals for a long time. And this was ACE. <coughs> so a postdoc of mine, Mike Krakauer, cloned the second copy, which we called ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme number two. Uh, <coughs> I should also acknowledge that we were not the first group which published a sequence of ACE2. Uh, we had it in the fridges for a long time. The reason is I'm a functional geneticist, so I make knockout mice, and I wanted to study the in vivo function of ACE2. So what is ACE2 actually doing in the living, breathing mammalian organism? And uh, after many papers and studies <coughs> confirmed in literally thousands of, of uh, experiments in many laboratories all over the world, <coughs> it, this is now what's in the textbooks, uh, and has been made the first knockout mouse of ACE2, which, which basically started this whole field. And and, um, and turns out ACE <coughs> makes a peptide which we call angiotensin 2, and ACE2 <coughs> clips the last amino acid and by, thereby inactivate the system. So a healthy renin angiotensin system is the balance between ACE and ACE2 activity. And the renin angiotensin system regulates fundamental processes of our physiology and disease, like heart function, blood pressure, a kidney disease. Uh, and every time angiotensin II overshoots, it makes cardiovascular disease worse, diabetic, nephropathies worse, fibrotic diseases worse. And um, ACE2 is basically the good guy in the system. It also clips other peptide systems like bradykinin and apelin, which might be actually important also for understanding of COVID-19. So when we started this work and fundamentally mapped out the function of ACE2 in the physiological context of protecting the heart and the kidney and also the cardiovascular system from overactive uh, over angiotensin 2, we also realized that ACE2 was actually heavily expressed in the lungs. So this was around 2001 when we started to doing this. Uh, our knockout mice have normal lung structure, normal lung function. And so to study ACE2 in the lung, a postdoc of mine, uh, Yumiko Imai, now a professor in Japan, in Osaka, developed one of the first intensive care units for mice to dissect, functionally and genetically dissect the pathways and molecules involved in acute lung injury and, and lung failure. And when we actually studied ACE2 <coughs> in this context, it turned out ACE2 mutant animals developed super severe acute lung injury, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So here in blue, the whole, the whole lung got leaky, there's massive inflammation. So basically what I'm telling you is uh, I want to make two points. First, ACE2 is the critical regulator of the ancient tensin system, renin angiotensin system, and negatively regulates the system. It protects multiple tissues from organ damage. And secondly, ACE2 protects the lung from severe lung injury. And then this little virus came into the world, the SARS coronavirus. So the outbreak was from October 2002 to July 2003. 8,000 people on the planet got infected. And, uh, and then this paper appeared in Nature by Mike Fasan at that time at Harvard that the SARS coronavirus, uh, might use ACE2 as an entry receptor. So ACE2 might be a receptor the virus requires via binding to its spike proteins on the surface to enter cells. Uh, however, there were many other receptors uh, uh, 
postulated to other candidates uh, SARS coronavirus receptors were identified. Since we had the only knockout mouse in the world at this time, we sent our ACE2 knockout mice to Beijing to the Peking Union Medical College, infected them with a mouse adapted SARS coronavirus, so this was around 2004. And as you can see in wild type mice, we can recover a virus, in the ACE2 knockout mice, we cannot. So this was actually the definitive experiment to show that in vivo, ACE2 is the essential receptor for the SARS coronavirus. No ACE2, no SARS infection. Also, in papers we published in Nature and Cell and Nature Medicine, they actually could put together a mechanistic picture what the virus infection is doing and why uh, using ACE2 as an entry receptor is bad news. Because uh, many triggers of injury, acid aspiration, pneumonia, uh, 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 bird flu, uh, the Spanish flu, uh, bacterial infections actually trigger terrain and angiotensin system. And via angiotensin 2 and the AT1 receptor, this enhances and makes more severe acute lung injury. Now ACE2 is the good guy. ACE2 protects from this because it clips angiotensin 2 and inactivates the pathway. Now the virus actually uses ACE2 as an entry receptor. By doing so, it downregulates ACE2 expression, and therefore the angiotensin 2 system becomes dominant and drives disease. Then we believe this is one of the molecular explanations why the SARS virus became a killer virus, because it hit a molecule to enter our body, which is actually protecting multiple tissues, including the lungs. So if this is real, we could, of course, make a soluble form of ACE2 uh, and protect against lung injury. And this is what we did. <clears throat> this is aseptic acid injury. And here at the error, we actually add recombinant human ACE2. And we can indeed stabilize the disease here in animal experiments. So based on this, over many years now, 15 years, actually, this biotech in Europe developed a recombinant soluble human angiotensin 2 converting enzyme number two, which we call APN01, <clears throat> for therapeutic use in acute lung injury and ARDS <clears throat> uh, in response to many infectious and non-infectious triggers of acute lung injury. And this molecule over the years actually was tested in 89 humans in phase one clinical studies and also in phase two clinical studies uh, with people with lung disease uh, with a reasonable safety profile. So this is where we were. Uh, mapping out the fundamental principles by the SARS virus became a killer virus. We mapped out basically all the physiological pathways of ACE2 could explain why this virus became a killer because ACE2 protects the lung injury and develop a medicine. Uh, and then of course uh, SARS-CoV-2 appeared in the world and based on the sequence published on January 10, it became very clear that ACE2 must be also the receptor for this new virus. Uh, since we had a soluble version of ACE2, of course, we could address immediately a fundamental question. Can a soluble ACE2 actually reduce the SARS-CoV-2 infections? And this was, of course, the idea. In SARS-CoV infections, SARS infection and SARS-CoV-2 infections, both of them use ACE2 to enter our cells. By doing so, they actually take ACE2 with them into the cells and inside the cell, of course, the virus does what the virus does. It replicates itself. It, it co-opts the machineries in the cell. The immune system gets going. And eventually, this leads to diseases which we call SARS and COVID-19. <clears throat> now, the idea was a soluble version of ACE2, of course, should like, work like a sponge <clears throat> uh, blocking the spike protein of SARS to bind to the real receptor. And by doing so, uh, reduce virus internalization and improve disease. I should mention that probably 90 or 95 percent of all efforts for vaccines against COVID-19 disease uh, uh, hit exactly this interaction where the spike binds to ACE2. So ACE2 became probably the most researched protein on this planet. Uh, working from everybody works on this, from the biologists to pharma companies to the vaccine designers to to art, uh, artificial intelligence people designing new medicine. So this is probably the heart of the interaction of the disease uh, uh, COVID-19. 
uh, also, but there are new mutants which have emerged, which actually probably make spike, and I hope it's not true, but make spike resistant against some of the vaccines. <laughs> so, and the monoclonal antibodies which are blocking this. Uh, so the virus could mutate to get itself out of the vaccination. However, uh, it cannot get out of uh, out of binding to ACE2 because if the virus mutates, it cannot bind to ACE2, uh, then we don't have the disease anymore, which we call COVID-19. So I think using soluble ACE2 as, as a blocking agent for the virus is probably the most rational thing to do. Uh, to actually do this, uh, we hooked up with a group in Stockholm. <clears throat> so this is the virus we use, isolated from the first patient in Sweden. This virus was used to infect VRO6 cells. <clears throat> in the black bar, indeed, we can have a virus infection. And uh, if we use human recombinant soluble ACE2, we can significantly, by a factor of 1,000 to 5,000 times, reduce uh, the virus load in these cells. So indeed it works, it's a self-fulfilling experiment because if ACE2 is the critical receptor, uh, not excluding that there might be other receptors out there, uh, of course a soluble form of ACE2 can reduce the virus infection. The other thing we wanted to ask is actually ACE2 could fundamentally help us to understand COVID-19 disease. The reason being ACE2 is expressed in the nose epithelium, the throat, the, the heart, the blood vessels, uh, the central nervous system, ACE2 expression changes with age, gender, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, smoking. It's the basic physiology because the renin angiotensin system is involved in so many functions. So if you, if you change it, it tip the balance and ACE2 changes. Also over the years, uh, in these papers here, we published that ACE2 is expressed in gut epithelium. COVID-19 patients get uh, diarrhea and it's also expressed in the proximal tubules of the kidney. So the question was, can ACE2 expression in these organs be the reason uh, and can this directly infect these tissues? Because initially COVID-19 was a lung disease with involvement of other tissues. But of course, if ACE2 is expressed in other tissues, it should be, the tissues should be infectable. To do this, we actually engineered human tissues, mm. uh, take stem cells, human stem cells, human iPS cells, engineer human organoids. So this is a a human kidney organoid together with Nuria Montserrat in, in Barcelona. It's very complex to see here in red as A2 expression. So we can make human tissue like structures which express A2. Mm -hmm. So this organoid uh, were made in Barcelona, flew to Stockholm, they infected, and indeed we can infect them with RNA. Uh, uh, so we, we can recover viral RNA, <clears throat> this viral progeny, meaning there's not just infection, but the virus makes new infectious particles. And again, we can block it with recomb human recombinant ACE2, soluble ACE2, because if ACE2 is the receptor, we can block this. The other thing which interested us was actually blood vessels, because the world is data of thromboembolism, involvement of blood vessels in children, of course in adults, being one of the major reasons why COVID-19 patients are dying. Uh, last year, we published a paper in Nature where we uh, uh, <coughs> developed a new technology that we can make perfect human uh, uh, capillary structures from stem cells. So we made these structures. Indeed, they express ACE2. We sent them to Stockholm, and indeed, they can be infected. And they make a viral progeny, and again, we can block it with human recombinant ACE2. So to put this all together, I think we actually uh, understand a lot and ACE2 can explain a lot. Uh, it's in the nose and throat epithelium that's the first landing site for the virus. Um, most people it might not do much, uh, have a common cold. If the virus gets deep into the lung, this is where ACE2 is expressed. Therefore, people get this very prototypic deep uh, uh, pneumonia. You probably heard uh, you can even hear a COVID-19 infection by the cuff, which makes, of course, sense because it's a particular type of, of lung cells which infected. If there's severe infection, the blood vessels open, there's inflammation, of course, the virus can escape from the lung and can escape other, and it can infect other tissues expressing ACE2, like the, the brain, the kidney, uh, the cardiovascular system, blood vessels, you name it. 
uh, which of course uh, <clears throat> lead them to at the end stages of COVID-19 in severe cases to very multi-organ involvement. Uh, ACE2 of course cannot explain everything. There's immune system uh, <clears throat> involvement, there's autoimmunity developing, uh, the blood clotting system is being turned on, which also actually angiotensin 2 can do. Uh, and so, however, I believe we can understand a lot, <clears throat> and ACE2 is clearly at the center of COVID-19. And uh, as I said, uh, many drug development efforts actually homing on, on blocking this infection. <clears throat> so based on all of this, uh, we're actually doing now a, a placebo-controlled, double-blinded phase 2B clinical study on severe COVID-19 patients in Europe and Russia. Uh, actually, we stopped recruitment yesterday, so if everything works, uh, middle of January we should have our data. The reason why we do this, and I also dare to say this might be one of the most rational therapies for COVID-19, is first, uh, ACE2 is the receptor. The virus cannot escape from this receptor binding even if it mutates. So an ACE2, as I showed you, reduces the infection. And secondly, uh, the rain and angiotensin system is turned on in multiple tissues, contributing to severity of disease. And ACE2, engineered in the same drug, actually blocks this. So in the same molecule, in the same drug, we have two protective functions, blocking the virus and protecting tissues from more severe disease. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, since this is a double-blinded clinical study, we, we're only allowed to see the data when everything is finished, uh, which takes now, uh, actually the clinical study is uh, 200 patients, mm -hmm. uh, they get seven days treatment, intravenous treatment of ACE2, and then we follow them up uh, for another four weeks, meaning uh, yesterday was last patient in, we have to wait four weeks, and then we can start analyzing the data. But we just published actually the first named patient, a woman who had a severe COVID-19 disease. Mm -hmm. I was intensive care unit in the in the medical in the University of Vienna, uh, and she was treated. She really was one of the first people treated with uh, mm -hmm. ACE2. And with this uh, name patient, we could have we got two critical answers. First, uh, <clears throat> does the person still make an immune response uh, to? the virus, because it's nice to say that this insoluble ACE2 blocks the virus, but maybe it changes recognition by immunity and there's no proper antiviral immunity. The answer was that she developed very good antiviral immunity, which was very critical for the safety of our trial. And secondly, it's nice to tell you that the rain and angiotensin system is important, but how do we know that this enzymatic function of your drug candidate still works in a real COVID-19 patient? The answer was it still works. So we got actually even in very few patients and named, named uh, patient uh, use a very critical answers which we need for the fundamental understanding. And of course, this also helps to guide many, many other drug developments and understanding of vaccines, uh, what's going on. And uh, just for the end, we recently published this paper where we combined blocking uh, the virus binding to its real receptor ACE2 with this drug soluble uh, ACE2 together with remdesivir. You know it's very controversial, remdesivir, if it works or doesn't work. The idea was like in the breakthrough for HIV therapy, you don't just want to target one weak spot of the virus. You want to target two or three weak spots. So with this, we target the entry of the virus, and we also target the replication of the virus. And we see actually very good additive effect, and we can reduce the doses of both drugs to very low doses. So I do believe the future of therapy of COVID-19 beyond vaccines, which of course are critical also, but we need medicine because this virus will not disappear probably for many, many years. It has not jumped into animals, uh, as we know, from mink populations and so on. So this virus will be with us. <clears throat> and, and many people probably won't take the vaccine, as we understand now. So we need medicine which work. And I'm convinced there will be medicine for critical ill patients and, and patients at the beginning of the disease. And one future of medical development is clearly combining different modalities 
of of drug of drugs to block different weak spots of the virus. <clears throat> and with this, uh, stop and, and thanks for listening to me. Uh, my message is really is to. <clears throat> Uh, is the critical regulator of the renin and angiotensin system protects against lung failure, is the receptor, a critical receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and actually can explain uh, the, the, co the, <coughs> the landing site of infection, why people can develop very severe disease. And of course, using this fundamental understanding, uh, we can develop medicines and vaccines, as we see, 95, 90% they're actually targeting the ACE2 spike infection. And this, this uh, I thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, we have time for, I think, two questions, and a couple have just popped up on the questions one. I'll just read the first one from Julian S. Is there residual spike protein expression on the infected cells following viral infection or release? Mm -hmm. Additional, uh, I, don't, I don't understand the question exactly. <clears throat> well, maybe we'll come back to that one. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, the second one uh, is question, is there experiment of affecting ACE2 knockout mice with SARS-CoV-2? as opposed to one that you've done uh, 15 years ago? Uh, for this, we need a, a adapted virus, so it can be done. Uh, actually, what's really interesting, and, and this is a critical question, everybody claims ACE2 is the critical receptor. Other people have claimed, for instance, in China, that CD1474, 47 is another receptor, neuropelin. But actually, nobody has done the real critical experiment as we did for the SARS infection. In fact, knockout mice or knockout ACE2 in tissues and in organoids and then infected. So, so confidentially, I can tell you we did this. We made kidney organoids. If you knock out ACE2, there's zero infection. Also, these organoids express still neuropelin 1, which is now uh, uh, considered a new receptor. In the kidney, neuropelin 1 does nothing, <clears throat> and also CD1147 does nothing, So, which does not exclude other receptors in other tissues. Thank you. Um, there's a few other questions that we'll save for the en end of the session, um, so just hang on to those, the last two questions. So thank you, Joseph, and we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Kai Dan, um, a professor and the vice dean of um, Zhongshan School of Medicine at SYSU. And it's my honor to co-host this symposium with uh, UBC. And uh, now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker from SYSU. So Dr. Hui Zhang is a professor of microbiology and the director of Institute of Human Virology at Zhongshan School of Medicine, SYSU. Before joining SYSU in 2009, um, Dr. Zhang was a full professor at Thomas Jefferson University in the United States, where he had worked for 12 years. So after he joined um, San Yat-sen University in uh, 2009, uh, he was appointed as the director of the Institute of Human Virology, and his major research areas are immune cellular therapy, the mechanisms of HIV latency, SARS-CoV-2 and HIV vaccine development, as well as high throughput screening for antiviral drugs. So now let's welcome Dr. Huizang for his talk. Dr. Zhang, it's yours. Um, can you open the microphone? I think oh, all right. Okay. okay. Can you now, hear me now? Yeah, it's now fine. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. And uh, it's my pleasure to present and share my work recently. 
uh, I really like to share my work with the UBC colleague, uh, which located in uh, Vancouver. I visited Vancouver a couple of times, and it's a beautiful city. Actually, my brother, a uh, real one, uh, my brother, uh, obtained his PhD in Samuel Fraser University. <laughs> so uh, I visited him a couple of times, and also made a lot of a plan transfer in Vancouver, and uh, attended the Banff conference, and also <coughs> take the airplane in Vancouver, it's a beautiful city, and it's, I'm so happy to share my work with my colleagues in Vancouver. Uh, my topic is uh, about the SARS-2 vaccine, okay. Well, first of all, you will see, okay, more than 63 million, okay, worldwide people get infected, okay, and uh, more than 1.4 people, million people died uh, because of the disease. Among these uh, countries nowadays, uh, the US, India, and the Brazil, and uh, Russia, and the France, these are among the top five countries most uh, infected. Okay, so it's very uh, worldwide, severe pandemic, okay. Of course, definitely, vaccine development is the key to terminate this pandemic and this tragedy across the world in the human histories. Well, for a regular vaccine, you will see, okay, it's not so easy to get it, okay. Uh, for polio, you will see, we finally, since we found the polio virus infection, and finally get the vaccine, it cost our 60 years. For, uh, for Ebola, it's more than 15 years. For SARS-1 and the MERS, we never get a vaccine just because it, uh, the epidemic terminated very soon. For SARS-2, okay, since the beginning of this year, okay, we almost reach our goal. Okay, next slide, please. I cannot control that. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, for the uh, traditional uh, vaccine development, you will see uh, for the preclinical trial, it usually costs about two to four years. And then in the clinical trial, it will cost phase one is one to two years. Phase two is two years, and phase two, phase three is two or three years. And even after getting the permission, it also costs another one or two years to verify the effect. But for the SARS-2 vaccine development, you will see, okay, it just takes months. It's really amazing, okay, within a year, we almost reach our vaccine goal, okay. So it's very quick development in the human histories. Next slide. Well, for the immuno response, for the immuno response, uh, the SARS-2 infected the, 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 the target cell, it will elucidate uh, immuno response. One part is the humoral immunity, another part is serial immunities. Uh, for the, both are very important. And the key point is neutralize the, the, the interaction between the virus and the receptor, which is the SE2. It's just described by the previous speaker. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, I cannot control. Yeah. Well, that is the overview for the candidate vaccine development. Almost more than 200 vaccine candidates has under development. Few of them reach to phase one, phase two, and phase three. Okay. Almost. Uh, 
no one get the license in the current time, but uh, you know, lots of them is in the phase three uh, develop, uh, times. In China, okay, there is a couple of uh, inactivated vaccine, and the uh, adenovirus vaccines has been uh, in the phase three. Uh, in the U.S., okay, everybody know Moderna and the BioNTech and the Pfizer uh, maybe finish the phase three, okay, which is the MRI vaccines. Next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, I cannot control that. Let me see. All right. Uh, for the uh, protein subset, subunit vaccine, uh, most of them still in the phase one or per phase, per phase one. Okay. Few of them reach to the phase two, including the uh, the. Dr. George Gauss, uh, double the dimer of the RBD, okay. The quickest one is uh, Norvax, which developed in the US, okay. It reached to the phase three now. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, okay. All right. For the a lot of particle vaccine strategies, actually, it has been developed in the recent uh, 10 years, okay? Uh, it, there are lots of, a lot of particle vaccines. Uh, some of them is based on the artificial materials, and uh, I'm talking now is a lot of particle based on the natural protein, which is a ferritin. Uh, developed, uh, uh, originated from a uh, bacteria, okay? Ferritin is a kind of a protein, it's a, a funny protein. It can self-assembly without any catalyst. It can assembly into a 24 mers, okay? Uh, which is a very tight, a very, it can hold very tightly, okay? Uh, so, a single protein, we cannot see on the electron microscope, however, if it's organized as a 24 mers, it can be seen on the uh, electron microscope. So we call it as nanoparticles, okay? Based on the ferritins, there has been some uh, clinical trial, phase one for the influenza. Is that there is two clinical trials uh, based on the HP ferritin, which is a panel, uh, 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 Paranis, okay. Another is a, a losing synthesis based vaccine, which has been uh, in the clinical trial for HIV. So the, those exper this clinical experiment, the phase one in experiment, already verified that ferritin particle is safe in the in in the in the clinical, okay. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, I cannot move, my God, okay. Please move, thank you, okay. Uh, the immunity, okay, lots of people use the uh, uh, subunit for the immunity. Most of them use, use uh, uh, the whole S proteins, but the, the production is not so not so easy, okay. So we would like to choose the subunit, which can also focus some epitope, can elucidate the immune response so easily and avoid some unnecessary antibody react, uh, response. So we choose RBD, which is uh, the receptor binding domain, Another uh, uh, subunit we chose is HR H2 region, which is located in the S2 regions. Um, so we we would like to display this two subunit on the 24 mile of the ferritin, and then connect these two three units together to become our large particles. So 
we based on these strategies and then studying our work and then this work is published recently in the Mutities. Okay. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Well, RBD is uh, uh, conserved across the difference uh, 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 beta family coronavirus. However, the HR region we chose the, is more conserved, okay, which look at in S2 regions. And also in the uh, RBD region, there is just a one epitope uh, for the CDA Re response. In the HR region, we have five CDA epitopes. So it's easier for us to use the HR region to elucidate the cellular immune response. Next slide, please. Well, from this uh, Phenogenic analysis, we will see the RBD uh, is less conservative, but for the HR region, is highly conserva uh, conservative across the uh, families of the coronavirus. Next slide. This is why we would like to choose kind of uh, cross, broader cross reactivities. I cannot say universal vaccine, okay, because we don't have the data for that one. But uh, I would like to say cross reactivities. Well, so we started to generate our nanoparticles through uh, express the ferritin from the E. coli and the RBD and the HR subdomain from the Choi cell, which is the mammalian cells. So uh, we get these two proteins together and then uh, isolated and then conjugated together to the, uh, see the six pictures. That is a cartoon to show, okay, the ferritin can connect it to the RBD and HR region without a catalyst. When we mix these three units together, they will just uh, automatically conjugate it, then we isolate it, then we get our pure uh, lot of particle vaccines. Next slide, please. Next slide. Well, next is our lot of particle to show uh, its, pure, its purity and uh, uh, it's a particle under the electron microscopy. You will find that there are some slight uh, morphology difference uh, without the RBD-HR uh, conjugation compared with the ferritin only. Next slide, please. Then we uh, inject our immunology, uh, the nanoparticles into the BOPC mice. Yeah, from this picture, you will find uh, we use the two uh, injections. First is the priming time at the week zero and the boost at the week four. So we just have uh, two injections. You will surprisingly found, compared with the monomer, okay, the nanoparticle illustrate the, the antibody and the high titer uh, anti-RBD antibody, okay, at a week, two weeks, which can reach the four, 10 to four, okay, titer. So it's pretty high and very fast to compare with the monomers. You will find that the monomer reach the highest one at the week six after the boost, okay. But uh, our lana particle without the boost, just uh, at the two weeks after the vaccinations, it will reach very high titers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, 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 oh I'm sorry. I need to show my. Uh, 
then we use the the title okay it's just to show the AGG okay but uh, this slide we show uh, it have the it can neutralize the white type uh, SARS-2 infections in the uh, from, uh, in the virus E6 right so this is the white type data okay uh, we know we will found the uh, we can get the RBD specific memory B cells and also long lived long lived plasma cell in the bone marrows. Okay, next slide please. So it indicates it can last a long time. And uh, that is the B memory cell or B, B cells response. That is the T cell response that and the upper panel is CDA. We are found that in the intracellular state in the, in the film gamma uh, IL2 and the TNR for significantly incre increase compared with the monomers and the controls. And the, for the CD4 cells, we are found in the film gamma also significantly increased, and but the IL4 is uh, not so significant. For the F and the G uh, figure, we use the spring cell elite spot to show the inferior gamma significantly increase, but the IL-4 is not so significantly increased. That means this is Th1 bio uh, cell, T cell immunoresponse. Next slide, please. Uh, this data shows the antigen presentation induced another particle is pretty high. Okay, when we choose the, uh, to check the DC uptake, you will find the uh, nanoparticle significantly pick up the, the nanoparticles and also the macrophages. The bottom bottom panel will show uh, the RB the nanoparticle can be captured by CD11B, which is the DC and the monocyte cell has been significantly uh, pick up. Next slide, please. Well, this is GNH is uh, human cells. In cell culture, we get the human donor PBNC cells and uh, educate the monocyte and DC uh, with the uh, of the different induced differential into the DC and educated with different uh, anti antigens, including the monomer and the, and the nanoparticle vaccines, and then we uh, treat this educated DC with the CDA cells, then check the elite spot from the CDA cells. The H data showed okay for three donors, we will found the three uh, significant uh, response. Uh, after educated by the DC, which has been pre-educated with the nanoparticles. The TFH cell and the GCB cell also increase it. This data shows the cross rate activity of the nanoparticle induced antibody response. I'm sorry, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. First of all, we wanted to know, okay, HR region can, in, can induce the neutralized antibody or not? What well, answer is yes, especially with the HR on the, uh, on the lot of particles. Although this uh, titer is not so significant compared with the RBD, okay, but still have significant uh, amount of the uh, neutralize the antibody in the HR, in those regions by the HR regions. For the, this is a pseudotype that with different uh, coronavirus envelope with SARS, MERS, and uh, another uh, uh, human, 229E and the OC43, and also another not infected human, but isolated by Dr. Zhen Li Shi, the RATG13, which is uh, has been isolated from the bat, okay, pseudotype. We also found our one neutral antibody can 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 neutralize this pseudotype of the virus. And then this data to show that our latter particle can illustrate the serial immunity against the 
bet, which is OC 14 or 43, but not the alpha coronavirus 229E. Okay, so the immune response just only occur for the beta families, not alpha families. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, that is our among, uh, we challenged the, that is uh, from the Bapsi virus uh, mice. This is a uh, humanized, uh, human SE2 mice, okay. We also check, found the titer, okay, for the, uh, is pretty high. It's reached to uh, 38,000, okay, uh, IC 50s. Next slide, please. Well, then we challenged the uh, SE2 mice with the uh, white type SARS-2 uh, virus, which has been isolated from a uh, input case, uh, which is D614G mutate, which nowadays is a currently popular, uh, popular epidemic in the Europe and the North America. Well, you will see, compared with the control, okay, which can reach to the titer uh, 5 times 10 to 7, our nanoparticle can decrease to zero, okay, uh, viral uh, uh, titers in the lungs, and the button panel shows there is no virus, and there no path path pathogenic changes in the lung tissues. Next slide. Well, then we all, that is the mice uh, mice data. Now we wanted to see the rhesus macaque, the monkey data. Okay, we also. Uh, immunize the monkey and, uh, two, two times, okay, priming and the boost, okay. We also found that the titer uh, can neutralize the, the white type of virus. Next slide, please. The titer can reach to uh, 4.2 thousand, okay. This is a focus reduction uh, neutralized uh, titer, okay, which is the IC50. You can check like that way, okay. And the top is the titer, the antibody, neutralized antibody titer. The bottom is the uh, serial uh, immune response, interferon gamma, and the IL-4 uh, shows interferon gamma significantly increase, but IL-4 not so significantly change. Next slide, please. Well, uh, to make sure our vaccine do not have the antibody dependent effect, uh, enhancement, sorry, okay. We check, uh, that you will get the serum and then to, to see can guide the, the, the pseudotype of the virus effect to, to the uh, 293T, which has been expressed uh, the antibody receptors, okay. Let's see, the FCYR, okay. Compare with the, 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 right, the right panel was with the Zika virus, which infected the mice, and then we got the serum, compare the mouse serum, we do not see any ADE in, the, uh, in our nanoparticle immunized. But we indeed see the ADE in the infected with the Zika virus summary. Much stronger immunogenicity than monomer subunit, that is our nanoparticle vaccine, strong neutralized antibody, uh, H1 biotocellular immune responses in animal vaccinations. Three, significant protection of uh, HSE2 mice from white type virus. Four, induction of cross reactivity protection against the other coronaviruses. Five, the, the production is high through the join and the E. coli expression system, and the, the nanoparticle is pretty stable, okay? No ADE and other toxicity in animal experiment. Next slide, please. Next slide. And the reason that I asked one of my students to, to summarize all the documented the, the vaccines, uh, put this in the table, 
and uh, our cat there is a United vaccine, a donor vaccine, a my vaccine, and the recombinant vaccine. We put our uh, vaccine in this catalog. It's the recombinant protein vaccines. So you have found our titer is pretty high. Next slide, please. Okay. Next slide. Hello? Okay, the circled one is our vaccines. In the mice, in the monkeys, okay, our titer compared with another vaccine, okay, uh, it's uh, in the mice is the highest one, uh, surprisingly, okay, we didn't know that before, okay. But uh, compare with you this one, you will see, okay, the inactive vaccine and in the donor vaccine, the titer in the animals is not so high. The MR vaccine is good, but the non operative vaccine developed by our lab, by Stanford, Peter, Peter King, and in the, in the Tencent, in the Oxford, the non operative vaccine uh, sh show uh, highest uh, neutralized uh, capabilities. Okay. So we are really so happy. Our title is pretty high. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. This work, all the work is done in the uh, Sun Yat-sen University, and uh, I really special thanks to the Dr. Xin Tai, Zhou Fei, and Rong, and Yao Chang, and Yi Wei. They are uh, contributed equally as a first order, and uh, that's the team in my lab. And also thanks to the BR3 lab team, animal uh, center team, and the core facility team in Sun Yat-sen University. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for this nice talk. And uh, because of the limit of time, we will have uh, just one question. So I, I am, I'm now looking at the Q&A box. Um, there's one question from Sean. So Sean asked Dr. Zhang that although the HR1-2 region is conserved, the exposure of this region is low due to the glycan shooting. Could anybody targeting HR region alone neutralize virus spike? Well, uh, that's good questions. Uh, we are doing this work, okay. Use the uh, super type of virus we can get. We can find that it can target this region. However, we are trying to answer this question use the white type of virus. The title is okay, but not so significant, okay. Actually, this part is not so uh, covered by, by the glycan shedding, okay. It's uh, it's okay, okay. It's okay. It can be shedding by the as as wiring, but another 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 tonight. Okay, but it's okay. Okay. Um, again, I would like to thank Dr. Zhang for this uh, wonderful speech, and uh, I apologize that we cannot ask more questions. So we will save some questions at the end for the panel discussion if we have time. Now well, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Guo Bao Tian. So Dr. Tian is a professor from the Department of Microbiology at uh, Zhongshan School of Medicine, SYSU. And he finished postdoctoral training at the University of uh, Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And he now has published over 40 articles in internationally influential journals including the Lancet Infectious Disease, the Lancet Microbes, and etc. Uh, his research mainly focuses on the antimicrobial resistance. So, Dr. Tan, it's now yours. Okay. Can you share your slide? Okay. Is it okay right now? Uh, we haven't seen it. Okay. Let's have 
please maximize the screen. Thank you. So, uh, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank uh, this great opportunity from, uh, to introduce my research. Definitely, uh, the COVID-19 is the hottest topic in uh, in the in recently. But uh, I think at, at the same time, we have to pay uh, more attention on other very important topic. So I think definitely antibiotic resistance is the one of them, and uh, first, uh, okay. First, I would like to introduce what we we are doing and what we have. Since I think this information may be helpful, and to to find the the potential cooperation. Um, first, so my, our our academic uh, interest to focus on the mechanisms and epidemiology of antibiotic resistance, especially in gram negative, uh, with the major focus on the beta lactams and uh, polymycin resistance. So the main uh, resistance mechanism for beta lactams is producing beta lactams and uh, the the MCR is a is a new plasmid mediated uh, resistant gene for for polymycin. So which these two two uh, uh, molecules are the most important uh, 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 factors for 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 me for risk uh, for during the past five years. And another hot topic in my lab is the evolution of antibiotics resistant genes. And uh, the third part in my lab is we, we are working on the mechanisms of uh, antibiotic resistance in MTB since we have a uh, the, 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 the a BCL3 lab. And during the past five years, we published uh, over 13 articles which uh, introduced by the host. So, and uh, at the same time, we during the past five years, we uh, we have awarded uh, 16 major uh, uh, fundings, which including three from the Nature Science Foundation of uh, China, called, we called the NSFC, uh, in which we uh, I in the 1970s uh, I I got the National Science Fund for. Uh, for outstanding young uh, scholars, and uh, and uh, what do we have, and uh, what 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 can I bring for for the potential cooperators? So we right now we have um, more than sixty thousand of AMR gram negative bacteria from uh, fifteen provinces in China, which. Uh, uh, Include uh, different uh, resources, including patients, uh, in or out patients, and uh, healthy human and food, and food animal and the environment. And uh, we, the main uh, technique for in our lab is to use the the the, the WGS. So right now we have. Uh, we have WGS data for more than uh, uh, 4,000 uh, AMI isolates, and uh, at the same time, I cooperate with uh, with uh, some cooperators on the compounds which uh, uh, exhibit antibiotic activity from both the traditional Chinese medicine and the nature products from the source of ocean. And during the past five years, we have had uh, more than 10 patents from, for, for the diagnosis of uh, resistant genes, such as beta lactam and MTB-associated uh, uh, resistant genes. 
and uh, as I mentioned before, we have PSA three and ABSA three labs in our institute, so which will help for us to do some researchers on the MTB resistance. That's definitely the most uh, uh, resources we have. And today, today I'm going to introduce one of the very interesting lab uh, job in my in my lab is uh, evolution of the antibiotic resistant genes. So evolution is a process by which a, a micro, mic, microbial population can be changed over generations. During the process, mutation and the, the uh, neutral selection are the two key factors for the result of evolution of the gene. For example, in several in every nucleotide can be mutant into other three types of, of nucleotides. And, uh, after, uh, and uh, when we have the pressure of uh, antibiotics, so then those, uh, those geno uh, genotypes with more resistant genotypes can be, can be selected. And th after that, the, those more resistant genotypes can be spread. Uh, spread yeah. And uh, so the research institute for the evolution uh, of the antibiotic resistant genes, is most of the study uh, focuses on the existed uh, mutant, mutants of the resistant genes. It is difficult to predict the evolutionary trajectory of mutation. So how to construct uh, uh, an biot and a comprehensive platform for the prediction of uh, evolutionary trajectory of resistant genes? Uh, here we established a method that can predict the evolutionary trajectories of resistant genes. The method has a couple of optimization, uh, which include at least three points, I think. We uh, 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 improved method of construction of single mutation, and uh, we established a high efficiency transformation system. And third, we combined the computation experiment and high throughput sequencing. Uh, I'd like to introduce the matter of construction of our mutant library. Uh, briefly, we used a primary, used a, a mixed primary and a fusion PCR to construct a the Aninus mutant library, which included all the single mutant mutation possibilities. We then transfer into resting uh, E. coli MG1655 and uh, integrated into chromosome. In this way, the Aninus mutant library was uh, credited. We then added the library into a medium containing, containing antibiotics. Following the library culture, we can harvest the library which survived under the, the antibiotic pressure. Through the, the high throughput sequencing, we can know the coverage degree of the constructed library for each type of mutation. Furthermore, the, the, the evolutionary trajectory can be predicted through the data elements of bioinformatics. Compared with the previous study, I think we, our platform can cover all the pos possible mut mutants in each nucleotide of resistance gene and can predict, predictably predict the, uh, prospectively predict the, the evolutionary trajectory of resistant gene. During the past four years, we, our lab constructs the single mutation library of CTXM beta-lactamase. CTXM beta-lactamase is the most widespread uh, beta-lactamase worldwide, which can hybridize the 
the Sipitaxis. Sipitaxis is the third generation of philosophy. Since its low uh, toxicity, it became the most important, most widely used antibiotic in the world. Until now, more than 200 uh, CTX and beta lactam virus have been funded, which means this gene is easy to be uh, uh, developed. And uh, the coding, the coding region of CTX and uh, beta lactam without the, the single, the signal peptide was 1762 BP. And then it has been divided into six, uh, 16 uh, fragments using the future PCR to in induce the mutations. The next step uh, was transfer transforming the, the cities and beta lactam muta mutation library into host bacterial uh, sufficiently to ensure each of the cell only include uh, only one copy of specific uh, genotypes, we established a uh, stable and uh, efficient uh, transformation mother that can integrate the gene into the chromosome. Meanwhile, to, uh, to make sure all the genotype can be tested by deeper sequencing, each genotype should uh, have at least uh, 15 to 100 colonies. Therefore, each uh, fragment should be uh, include 12,000 colonies. So the total uh, library including more than uh, 200,000 colonies for this uh, beta lactamine. Beta uh, in order to confirm the dependability of the library, we verified each key step of the library construction. First, we performed the third generation sequencing to detect the genotype in our library. The results show that our library contained all single nucleotide constitutions. We then confirmed that the uh, protectability of the library. We found that the small library exhibited uh, hydrodized activity against uh, cephalotoxin, indicating that there are some genotypes more competitive than the Y type. In addition, Partial of the library was placed on LB uh, agar containing uh, cephalotoxin drugs. After 12 hours of incubation, incubation the colonies was randomly picked for PCR amplification and uh, single, uh, single uh, sequencing. We found that after treatment with high uh, concentration of cephalotoxin, the genotype of the colonies become more uh, cl clustered, uh, indicated that the, uh, the close the close in re relationship between CTX, CTX and beta lactam variant genotype and the phenotype. Therefore, to predict the evolutionary trajectories, we uh, expanded the experiment and the sequencing the genotype both the uh, pre-culture and after-culture. After-culture in the subtoxin with half MIC concentration, the library, the, library the, the, uh, the, the bacterial library was collected at two time points. The effect size is the uh, quantitative measure of the magnitude of the of the, 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 the phenotype, the, the phen phenomena, sorry. Uh, a more con a con uh, considera con a considerable absolute value always indicated a stronger effect. So based the uh, uh, effect size, the red, the red means the beneficial genotype in this condition. So our data showed that uh, though in the time point change, 
but the 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 the, the predominant gen, uh, genotype remain uh, remain similarly. And last, uh, we 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 combined all the five time points compare to uh, find that some genotype were always the the dominant genotype among the five time points, indicating that some amino acid residues play an important role in hybridization. Moreover, from structure model is I have to show here. Uh, it showed uh, the conserved uh, residue in the uh, surface of CTXM, uh, beta-lactam protein. That's all the results right now we have. And uh, so ne the next step, we are working on the, the, the construction of the model which can predict CTXM, beta-lactam mutation directions. And, uh, we we are we are injecting the, the, the library, I mean the, the mutation library into animal model since we want to, to confirm our result in in vivo. So that's most all the data we have right now for this uh, very interesting project for me. And uh, last I want to thank the, the our founders, uh, NFFC and MLST and uh, I want to thank my students, and uh, most of the uh, exams have been done by, by then, and thank you my my institute. So thank you for this opportunity. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, great. I want to thank Dr. Tian for this very interesting talk. Um, looks like we don't have uh, questions from the Q&A box, uh, so I will ask one instead. So, uh, Dr. Tian, can you um, predict or uh, what do you think about the uh, physiological relevance of the prediction of your uh, uh, resistant gene to the clinical situation? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, so that's a very good question. So the main, the main purpose for this project we want to connect with, uh, with the clinic. So we are we have right now we have a uh, we have two models. One model we can predict the 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 trajectory, trajectory directions for the recent genes, which we want using in the clinic. So hopefully we can find a method which can be used by the doctor to see if this genotype can be uh, more resistant or more susceptibility. That's that's one of the the the, 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 the main purpose for. So thank you for the question. Great. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Tian, for the nice talk. And let's move on to the next speaker. Good. Thank you, Kai. I'd like to introduce the next speaker is Professor Laurie Brato from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology here at UBC. And she's the executive director of Women's Health Research Institute and holds the Canadian Canada Research Chair in Women's Sexual Health. So although we've heard a lot of molecular aspects of uh, COVID, both on the virus and, and various aspects of the um, structure of, of the virus, Laurie's one of our leads on the psychosocial response, which is sort of equally important when you look at the COVID disease itself across the population. And she will be talking about today her project named COVID Response um, in really looking at this very important aspect um, in the pandemic. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you very much. And just doing a sound check that you can hear me okay? Loud and clear. Excellent. Um, so again, thank you very much for this uh, invitation. These talks have been fascinating um, because I always learn something new when I listen to basic science talks. So thank you to the previous presenters. I do want to start by acknowledging that our work at the Women's Health Research Institute is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, which includes the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. So with regards to COVID-19, sex disaggregated data reveal a higher case fatality rate for males compared to females. Of note, however, there are exceptions in some countries, such as India, where case fatality is higher in females. In a comment published recently in the Lancet Global Health two weeks ago, the authors 
speculated whether these higher rates in females might be due to factors related to their gender. So we already know that pandemics can compound differential exposure and outcome for girls, women, sex and gender minorities, caregivers, and other essential workers involved in gendered occupations. So we at the Women's Health Research Institute um, designed a two-part study which involves completion of a survey followed by examination of antibodies collected by dry blood spot sample. Note that in this presentation today, I'm only going to be focusing on a very brief snapshot of the mental health outcomes. Um, I do want to acknowledge our full team from the Women's Health Research Institute and our collaborators at BC Children's Hospital Research Institute. So a significant strength of our project is that it draws from seven existing uh, British Columbia cohorts that are representative of the population of women, totaling over 40,000 individuals who consented to be contacted for research. They received an email invitation that described the study and obtained their e-consent. And then the link took them to a survey which consisted of a core module that focused on a comprehensive epidemiologic survey on COVID-19 risks and symptoms, sociodemographics, medical history, and also vaccine attitudes and intentions to vaccinate. They then proceeded to complete four additional modules that focused on substance use, psychosocial outcomes, and gender-based violence, um, and as well, economic outcomes and healthcare disruptions. Where appropriate, such as with our psychosocial outcomes, we used validated clinical scales and at the end of participants completing the survey, they were invited to send the survey link to one household adult member who identified as um, being of a different sex or gender. Um, and they were also invited to provide their address to receive a dry blood spot kit to measure antibody responses, and those are being prepared right now. So looking a little bit at our collected sample, the participants were stratified into nine five-year age strata from the ages of 25 to 69, with a target of recruitment being 750 uh, people per age stratum or a total of 6,750. The data that I'm sharing with you today are based on just short of 5,400 um, individuals, and we had about a 30% response rate. Now, really importantly, while we administered the survey at only one point of time, for some of the questions, we did ask participants to think about their experiences at three specific periods of time. The three months pre-pandemic, during phase one of the pandemic, which was mid-March to mid-May in British Columbia, and after phase two, which started middle of May. Um, and we're now collecting longitudinal data. So first of all, um, the mean age, and you can see this on the table on the right-hand side, the mean age of the participants was 51, and most of the respondents so far identified as female. In terms of gender, which relates to one's identity of being woman, man, non-binary, trans, two-spirit, etc., we had 59 individuals who identified in tra as trans and non-binary. And I'll emphasize it's really important to um, listen to the experiences of these individuals because they tend to experience adverse events and stressors in far more significant ways. Um, plus, there's additional stigmatize stigmatization that uh, prevents them from getting care. For this presentation, I'm really going to focus on sex differences. So this relates to birth assigned female versus male. Um, what you can see on the left-hand side is the age distribution of our participants in green against the population of BC residents in purple. So you can see that the majority of our participants so far are in the 40 plus age category and we're actively recruiting those under 40 to ensure that we reach our target sample size. So let's jump into the results now. So um, we used a validated measure of depression, um, and uh, we used a measure that is commonly used clinically as well as in research studies. And just to orient you to the graphs, the male participants are in purple on the left, and the female participants are in green. And then you can see the three slices of time, pre-pandemic, during phase one, which was uh, corresponded with the highest levels of pandemic controls, and then phase two, when those pandemic restrictions started to loosen. 
So importantly, females saw a significantly higher, higher rates of depressive symptoms than males, and you can see that this escalated significantly from pre to one of the pandemic. On the right-hand side, when we separated out the data by age, you can see that the highest burden of depressive symptoms was borne by the youngest age cohort, those age 25 to 30. And though not graphed here, our uh, gender non-binary and trans group, again, of 59 individuals, had scores that were even higher than the females uh, that I'm showing on this slide. So next, we isolated uh, those individuals who had clinically significant, so severe levels of depression that would warrant a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. Um, and you can see the effects that I've just described being replicated here with females showing significantly higher rates of severe depression by males than males. But you can see from pre-pandemic to phase one with highest pandemic controls that the proportion quite significantly increased for females. And that effect was also seen uh, for the youngest age cohort, um, the youngest individuals being the most likely to fall into that moderate to severe depression group. So next we looked at anxiety. And anxiety is really defined as a fear of the unknown combined with a loss of control. And certainly that testament was expressed by a lot of people just in the public and in the media in regards to when will this end, what is going to be the impact on my financial situation, my family, my health, etc. And so we used, again, a validated measure of generalized anxiety that maps on well to worries um, and fears. And so you can see here on the graph on the left that females had significantly higher scores than males. And from pre-pandemic to phase one, a significantly higher increase in those anxiety scores. And again, the exact same effect uh, with the highest levels of anxiety being expressed by the youngest age cohort. Next, we looked at severe anxiety. So again, this would map onto a, um, a clinical diagnosis of an anxiety disorder, such as a generalized anxiety disorder. Females showing the highest rates where nearly 20% of the females surveyed in um, phase one of the pandemic uh, would have met criteria for an anxiety disorder and significantly higher than males. Um, and here on the right, you can see that it's really the youngest age cohort across the board um, that show these scores the worst. And of course, the, the trans and non-binary group of 59 had even higher magnified increases of, of severe anxiety. Now, loneliness has um, received a lot of attention in the last two, two to three weeks, in particular here in, in BC and in Canada, um, as our pandemic controls have tightened even further. And there's been a real concern about uh, the impact of loneliness and loneliness as a risk factor for suicidality, which we know we've seen increasing rates of suicidality during this pandemic. So we isolated the question on loneliness um, to look at, uh, again, sex differences here. Again, no surprise, females are self-reporting more loneliness. And interestingly, this was regardless of whether women were working or not working, whether they were around individuals. Sometimes that experience of loneliness uh, might, not be, uh, might not relate to how many people you see. There can be deep feelings of loneliness, even if one is uh, around other people. And again, we see this magnified in the youngest age group. Um, our last psychosocial measure was uh, something called the crisis. And the crisis, uh, which is the Coronavirus Health and Impact Survey, was validated by the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, as a quick index of mental distress and resilience. And this measure has been used now in several studies to provide kind of a snapshot of health, well-being, and coping, and used as a predictor of who is going to fare worse in the face of a pandemic. And thus, we should really um, uh, tailor our mental health resources to those individuals. So again, with the crisis score, no surprise, females showing significantly higher scores than males, um, and that increase from uh, pre-pandemic to, uh, to the highest level of, con of controls during the pandemic. 
intimate partner violence. And we know that the data um, that emerged from China early on in the pandemic, and we were reading papers in January about the rates of intimate partner violence um, being three times as high in the early stages of the, the pandemic in China. Um, and we certainly know from past pandemics and other past significant global stressors that these are times when intimate partner violence significantly increases. So we looked at uh, the prevalence of, of self-reporting intimate partner violence only among our participants who were in a relationship and who were female. So we do not have data on males for this. And, and um, in part, it's because uh, of, of the safety of how we recruited the males to the study. So we didn't want any linking of this question from household members who both filled out the survey. We asked essentially whether the person had experienced any of a list of intimate violent acts, such as being hit, thrown, pushed, grabbed, shoved, slapped, kicked, bit, beaten, choked, or forced sexual activity. And really importantly, what you can see here, these are absolute numbers. Um, overall, the numbers are low when we look at the prevalence based on, um, uh, you know, when you t look at the denominator here. However, uh, there was a significant increase in the number of reports of intimate partner violence from pre-pandemic to phase one. And this is obviously very, very worrisome because um, during a pandemic, when pandemic controls are high, it means that women are less likely to ask for help because of fear that their perpetrator is with them. And so there are simply not, uh, there are no safe options for her to ask for help. Um, we asked also about substance use, and this also was a, a concern uh, very early on in the pandemic, of course, because of the concern that would individuals turn to alcohol and substance use as a way of coping with increasing levels of depression and stress. And we asked the question, has your consumption of alcohol changed since before the pandemic? And what you can see here, um, by the way, these are confidence intervals, not error bars. So it just shows you the kind of um, esti uh, the precision of our estimate with these, with these, these bars here. Basically, anyone up until the age of 60 reported about, there was about 30% across those ages who reported uh, an increase in their alcohol use from pre-pandemic to uh, phase one of the pandemic. Um, slightly lower rates for the trans and non-binary group. What about for cannabis use? You can see that it was really the youngest age group, 40% in the youngest age group reported from pre-pandemic to phase one, um, increasing, significantly increasing their use of cannabis and that decreasing with uh, subsequent ages. And here's the number for the trans and non-binary group. So finally, I'm just going to show you a few of our economic outcomes. Of course, we asked a lot of questions about um, the economic impacts, keeping in mind that 2 million Canadians in the, in the month of April had lost their job. And there were a lot of concerns about the impact on food security, housing security, and ability to uh, pay for meals and pay for families. So focusing, first of all, on food security, uh, food security is really one of the keys to health and well-being. It relies on access to sufficient nutritionist, uh, a nutritional safe food. Um, so just to focus on the phases here first, you can see that both men and women from pre-pandemic to phase one reported um, an increase in the proportion of them who said that, they're, uh, that they were food insecure. In other words, their household ran out of food and they were not able to purchase more due to financial reasons. And you can see the significant sex difference here with wi uh, females being more likely to report that. Housing security asks about the stability of the housing situation. And so the question we asked here, um, my housing situation was unstable. Again, you see an increase from pre-pandemic to the highest levels of controls, but that didn't go back down as the pandemic controls started to loosen. Um, in fact, there was this kind of leveling off or the unstable housing situation for our participants really continued despite um, some of those social controls and pandemic controls starting to loosen. 
finally, the last bit of data I want to show you is, is pretty fascinating. And we asked about the number of hours per week that were spent on various activities. And of course, this coincided with uh, children being at home and parents now being forced to homeschool them for the first time. Um, and we asked about the number of hours per week spent on your paid work this ver versus a number of other activities. And you can see across the board, from pre-pandemic to phase one, um, that the number of hours per week spent uh, with childcare significantly increased. In fact, more hours spent in childcare than it was with paid work. Now, interestingly, the next slide I'm going to show you is the sex differences, males versus females, and you can see uh, by dismantling by sex, some of the, the, the findings emerge. Uh, whereas for, for males, there were more hours spent with paid work um, compared to childcare and supporting children's education. Uh, but for females, um, they spent more hours uh, taking care of children than for paid work. And this is after controlling for who was working versus who wasn't working. So in conclusion, uh, our data show a significant effect of sex with females being disproportionately more impacted by depression, stress, loneliness, anxiety, um, substance use, alcohol use, um, and, uh, and other psychosocial outcomes. And these really call for a sex-specific tailored response when we think about what kinds of psychosocial supports we have available. And finally, I do want to emphasize the young people in this group, um, many of whom are students and are trainees that work with us who are really experiencing the brunt of the burden and many of them being separated by family um, and suffering financially significantly. So we do want to uh, make sure that when we talk about supports that we have that younger generation and students in mind. Thank you very much for your attention and want to thank the rest of the, the team as well. Thank you, Laurie. Most interesting. Shows you the effects of the pandemic really across the society. Uh, we have one question, and it's actually a, a double header, but on the same same theme, is that the age discrimination, the age of the age demographics for depression and anxiety, where the younger should I think are higher, is opposite to the risk of getting the, of COVID, um, and similarly, anxiety, depression, and others with females is I think it was mostly always higher than males, and yet males have a higher risk of well, certainly of severe disease. How does that correlate psychologically? Yeah, it's such a good, I mean, basically what it illustrates to us, the fact that the youngest group were more vulnerable to depression and anxiety probably speaks more to the phase of their life that they are in, in terms of, you know, they're at a pivotal age in their 20s and early 30s when they're thinking about career and job. Um, maybe traveling, maybe settling down. Um, and so it, it, it does emphasize when we talk about the, the, that COVID, that there, it really is a, a double-headed experience, that there's obviously the, the physiological expression of COVID and who's most vulnerable and mortality as well, but the impact of pandemic controls uh, and those effects on psychosocial outcomes, we'll probably see the, the brunt of that for years to come. So it just emphasizes that when we measure uh, the COVID entity that we keep both halves of those equations in mind. And what about the second half is about female to male, where the, say, it, uh, I think the, the highest, the uh, largest age category is around 50, where, where there's a lower risk for females, yet there's a higher anxiety. Yeah, um, and, and I can think of an answer right there. Is they're worried about everybody in the world. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's 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 exactly it. And and to be honest, this, the findings were not surprising here. Um, uh, I I do want to. I didn't conclude about paying more attention to the the sex and gender minorities, and they tend to get excluded from research because they tend to be a smaller group. But they're really the group that we want to make sure that we follow the long term uh, psychosocial outcomes with. Good. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Move on then. Hi, thanks. Okay, thank you for the wonderful talk, and thank you, Robert. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, last speaker of this morning or this uh, afternoon, uh, Dr. Cleve Young. So uh, Dr. Young is a professor of technology in the Sunshine School of Medicine Science and University. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree at UC Berkeley. PhD at UC San Diego, 
and um, postdoc training at Columbia University Medical Center. And he joined SYSU faculty in 2015. And he would like to introduce more about himself um, later on. So let's welcome Cliff. It's yours. Um, can you open the microphone? Okay. We can hear you. Yes. Okay, I'm good. Okay. I'm the last guy here, so let's keep it nice and simple. All right. My little story is actually about two things, viral resistance and T-cell primary. And normally, you actually think this is the COVID-19 virus on the left side, and this is the T cell on the right hand side. You would think those two things are equal, but as I will tell you eventually, that that depending on your perspective. Um, before we before we start, I'd like to thank people who did the work. So this work is mostly done by my PhD student Owen in the red circle here, and I actually like to take this occasion to to thank Dr. John Wei, who is really really supportive of our junior PIs who will join our university, our medical school. All right, let's get started. Um, so for people who are not immunologists, I would like to introduce a very nice of cells called CD8 T cells. They're also called CTLs, as you hear often. As you can see from this video here, they're, they really like to kill cells. Actually, it's actually forcing them to commit suicide. So we've got CD8 T cells. They can eliminate infected cells and also cancer cells. Uh, yeah, they're awesome cells, but I'd like to tell you that they're useless unless we prime them with dendritic cells. So T cells must be activated by antigen presentation by dendritic cells. So here, our lab really focuses on how dendritic cells, the short PCs, how they prime or activate T cell responses. And today I'll talk to you about one particular subset, which is the CD1 subset. So why do we care about you know, naming this C1 subset? This C1 subset has a very special function for uh, cross presentation. Uh, if you go back to your old immunology textbook, right? There's class, there's class one, there's class two, and there's the class uh, presentation, in which we have, uh, which goes into C4 and C T cell. But there's a special way, it's called cross presentation, in which the CDC1, it's in the DC, so eat the extracellular antigens, or pathogens, and then present them to the CAT cells. This is called cross-presentation, because this is a mix between class 4, 1, and 2. I mean, there's even a process for cross-dressing, if you really want to look on that. Pretty fascinating. Anyway, let's move on to cross-presentation. And uh, uh, most of the audience here care about virus, so we will talk about viral infections. Why is this antigen presentation important for viral infections? So first, we have to let you know that our immune system wants to be there fast, and they want to see the antigen first. But unfortunately, our viruses are very smart, and they do not always infect the gray cells, which can find the T cells. And secondly, uh, as most biologists will actually know that, you know, our viruses have so many different ways to inhibit the classical image class 1 presentation. So cross presentation is a backup plan for that. And for people who care about tumors, uh, actually, the two antigens are exclusively cross-presented by CDC1s, and that's how you activate anti-tumor CAT cells. Now, we all lab would have discovered one very interesting molecule called TBT1. It is very, very high expression CDC1. It is doing in very different ways, even by a really, really bad Western. That's typical for immunologists. So we can see this molecule is very, very high expression in CDC1, the one that is capable of cross presentation to CDT cells. Uh, so what's P, P, T, 1? Let's focus on the first T. The T actually comes from palm trees. This is a very useful tree. It actually goes into a Nutella. So as you eat your Nutella and you, you get this palmitate acid, which will be modified to be attached to proteins. So in the old days, uh, very similar work. Uh, it's shown that conservation is very important for uh, RAS TPH for endosome recycling. And more recently, there's more function for the immune system in which they can change PDL1 or SAP3 population. Uh, so what about PDP1? This is actually an enzyme, the acetate, that does the reverse. It's the one that removes the 
palmitic acid from your protein. Now, you can look at the literature for BD1, and it's all actually about yoga science. Some of the doctors actually know, right? This is this is when it belongs to one disease called the NCLs. It's actually quite quite common in the northern Europe due to the founder effect. Maybe in the medieval times, the Christian village is confounded by a whole ship of immigrants. So in this particular case here, there's a case called INCL, in which the the symptoms are solely caused by a mutation of PDD1. Um, so the patients here are quite, um, they actually lose their speech by two years old and become brain dead by four years old. So as a, uh, and people have subsequently used knockout mice to to find a similar phenotype in the mice, right? And then find out that PDD1 is involving neuron cells, crosstalk, the synaptic vesicles. So, but however, it comes back here, I don't even know. So my question is, what's the role of the PVT1 in the immune system? And we have used, used a very, the first thing one test with viral response, and we use the model virus or VSD. You probably know VSDG, which is, we use it for our <laughs> transfection all the time, but uh, this is a very set of habits, means we're killing everything, because on the left hand side, we'll put it with the CDC1 to kill the CDC1 right away. It's, it's seropathic, it's pantrophic, trophic, because it binds to a very common receptor in all cells. In vivo, it's actually neurotrophic, because this is a relatively baby virus, and it actually does not infect DC stress, in fact, macrophages stress. So we are shown here on the right hand side that uh, the CDC1 that involved in the anti VSD CDAT cell response. So what happens to the uh, uh, not on my shirt. So when you infect the mice with ESD, we found out the tire is actually higher, and also, and also the the T cell response are way off, which is not very effective. T cells are just not doing so well. Um, so what's the problem here? So we are in, doing something in vitro in which we infected a VSD GFD of the cord, and we found out the knockout PC is actually having a GFD. And just to make sure, we take the supinated out and put the titer. Um, the VSD have found out also similar things that, you know, this is the knockout mice, the, the knockout DC is going to get infected more. And in a separate, more complicated chimeric experiment, I can tell you that in vivo, we also saw the same thing, that only CDC1 tends to get infected more if you knock out the PVP1 gene. So, so you, in, in a very nice style from Donald Trump, right, which is so right, in, in terms of our infection, no PVP1, bad, very, very bad. So what about bacteria infections? This is almost part of our immune response. So we're using the hysteria, which is a very common foodborne pathogen that gives you diarrhea, and also abortions in, in pregnant women. Uh, we do infection with the natural mice, and actually found out something really crazy here, is that uh, in opposite to the viral infection, uh, we actually get resistant to hysteria infection. You could do a P, uh, um, PID, uh, CID here, right? You can not see any, any, any colonies from the natural mice. And so it's only right here, you could do bacteria infections, it's like the best thing in the world. You can just fight, it provides resistance to, to the bacteria infection. So what about tumors? It's uh, one thing for cross presentation. We can also see that in the knockout lines, the tumor size is much smaller with different types of tumors, so I mean, NC38 and AD16. And also the survival is also better if you knock out PVT1. Well, I'll go back to our Trump summary here. So no PVG1 is very good for tumor response, right? You lose it, it's awesome. If you lose it, you can fight bacteria infections, but you can lose it, you know, it's not so great when you're doing viral infection. So we have two opposite phenotypes here, and how do you explain that? So let's look at the mechanism for that. So going a little background on the immunology here, is that we actually know that, that our immune cells, right, when they take the antigen, they it's like your stomach, right? Your stomach must be acidic, so you can digest them and, and, and protect yourself. For our dendritic cells, actually it's not that acidic because we cannot just digest everything into amino acids. That would be no use for antigen presentation, which is a, a peptide, a 7 to 8 or, or 11 to 14 amino acid peptide. So if you downgrade it to amino acids, there's no way you can present it because it's all peptides. But also we know that Keeping everything acidic is essential to protect yourself. Otherwise, you just have diarrhea all the time. So this exists a dilemma here. Whether do you sacrifice 
from perfection to better preventive T cells. So we'll see what's going on here. And also, in the human studies, we can see that the, in terms of flu and HIVs, we found that in human CDC1, they're really good at protecting themselves. So the question is, how do the CDC1 solve this dilemma, right? How do we do the job so well of priming T cells and also protect ourselves so well? So in this case, we're just going back to the data here using the PPG or knockout mice of DC. If we give the DCs antigens and look at the how they degrade antigens, we can find out that the knockout cells are uh, uh, not doing so great at degrading antigens. Right? Is the degrading antigens slower using two, two different methods of present proteins? So why is that? I should check the pH directly. There's a, there's a region called pH rodeo, which you can do a standard curve. And then you can estimate the endosomal pH in the, in the cells. So in here, using two types of different uh, cell sources, we can find out that the knockout lines have much higher thyrosomal pH than the wall cells. So, so going down from there, what's going on here? We know BTPAs, which is a pump, the proton, that's what keeps the pH in endosomes. And we found out in the, the knockout mice, there's less co-localization because that means yellow in the wild type here. So, so less ATPase in the endosomes and less proton being pumped in, resulting in the endosome being less acidic. So coming back to the summary here, uh, so we know that without PPU1, the endosomal pH is much higher. So how does it, how does it explain the phenotype of the viral or bacterial or tumor infection? Uh, so here, this is probably pretty easy for biologists, right? We know viruses are very, very fragile, right? You can kill it with disinfectant or maybe just a little bit of acid. So here we can see that, you know, you just keep the VSP a little bit of acid, case four or five, they just don't survive. Uh, in comparison, the stereo, which is a bacteria, a very thick cell wall, it's not going to be affected by this, you know, uh, you know, acidic environment. I mean, it's not too acidic, but that's enough for the viruses. So if we artificially give the decrease the thyrosomal pH by giving the ammonium chloride, we can actually increase the infection rate, indicating that the acidic thyrosomes are important for protecting the cities one from viral infections. So we're so that's why we're explaining why viral infections is bad because our pH is higher, so we cannot protect ourselves against the viral infections. So what about the two other phenotypes in which everything is better with, without PVD1? This will come to the role of cross presentation of T cell being fine. So in this case, we're doing everything in vivo. We show that antigen presentation by a CD1 is way better in knockout. So that explains more the, uh, the phenotype in the uh, bacterial infection and also tumor infection. So in the interest of time and, and also uh, I'm not showing any T cell subset, whatever data here, so otherwise everybody go crazy. So uh, if you have questions, you can ask more about T cell priming here. Um, so lastly, I want to say, oh, so there's two separate functions here, right? So how do we balance that? How do we do two excellent jobs at the same time? Here we're looking at the PDQ1 expression in CDC1 uh, cells after expression, after activation. We found out this is not a steady expression. It actually was really down-regulated after activation. And at the same time, the cytosomal pH actually goes up. So what happens here is this. Well, PVD1 is really high. It goes down after activation and goes back again. And then the endosomal pH goes up after activation and also at the same goes across the patient. So if we artificially turn it off by using knockout, we get better T cell priming. If we artificially turn it on all the time with old expression, we get worse T cell priming. So in this paper, we, uh, in this project, we're, we're thinking TDD1 is actually a switch of loss presentation. During steady phase DC1s, we have loss of TDD1, keeping the endosomal acidic, so we can protect ourselves from the acid-sensitive viruses or pathogens. So then that's not good for presentation because it's too acidic. We need antigen peptides. So when we get activated, we down-regulate TDD1 and then make it more alkaline, and then increase priming for the T cells here. Your call will be disconnected. Uh, so let's keep it nice and short. So any questions? So I think our work has shown uh, more questions.